Man, so so I think we should tell people that we um, have never had a conversation before. Yeah. <laughs> at, least I don't, at least I don't think we have. <laughs> no, no, it's the first time. That's great, man. So first of all, great to meet you. Um, great to connect with you. I've seen some of your stuff on social, and I just thought, this guy looks awesome. I want to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, you as well, man. Yeah, you're putting out a lot of like great content for the cold leaving stuff. So I got a lot of things to talk about on, on, on that subject. <laughs> Bro, thanks. That's awesome. So tell, tell everybody, like, just give us like a high level view of who you are. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so we're actually running a YouTube channel called Property Hustlers. We're using real estate to create wealth uh, for ourselves and we're trying to like elevate other people using the, literally the same path, right? Um, I actually started investing back in like 2010 when I just got into university. My parents was a, such a big mentor for, for my real estate journey. They got me into my very first deal and then they actually wrote 20 on my notebook and saying that, hey, listen, by the time you finish school, you need to have 20 people paying you rent, right? So they kind of set up a goal for me and, and that was like really uh, allow me to build on my, my foundation. And wow. just, like any, just like everybody else, right? I started with a co-living type of concept. I was living in one room, rent out the rest of the, uh, at the time it was a four bedroom, right? So, uh, so I, I was living in one room, rent out the other three, and then we had to do the value at uh, approach for the basement to turn that into another apartment. So. From four to six, the next project is also four to seven. The next one is, I think, it was a five to eight, and then the last one was a um, was also like four to seven. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, by the time I finished, it was like it was like twenty seven tenants uh, paying the rent. Um, yeah. Cutting out for you guys. Cutting out a little bit for me. We were wondering. There you go. We got you back. We got you back. We're working through it. We're working through it. There you go. So you said started off at four bedrooms, but ended up at seven. Is that what you were saying, basically? Yeah, yeah. Four, four to six is my first one, and then uh, and and yeah, and then kind of just continue. So every single property, we we are adding more rooms uh, into the property, right? Value add. That's awesome. Get a little more cash flow. Yeah, that's basically what happens. Well, that was gonna be my question for you. Was like, hey man, what do you think of co living? <laughs> oh no, it's a, <laughs> sounds like you've got a good experience with it. Yeah. You have to, right? You have to, because uh, here's the thing: that in today's market, one single union is not going to make you uh, even positive cash flow. We're, we're not even going to talk about the wealth, because you can't even make a positive cash flow. Two unions, maybe, depending on where you are, right? But you need to have multiple different unions, right? Three and above, right? At least, and that's why I think if you're starting out and you're multi, yeah. What um, did one of your superpowers I heard is uh, one of your superpowers is raising capital. Like, or is that is that something you focused on or you train on? Talk to me a little bit about talk to me a little bit about raising capital. How you do that? What your mindset is around that? And like, what you would say to someone who maybe they have enough for one property, but they don't have enough for two, but they want to continue to grow. They want to continue to expand. Like, what's your how do, how do you think about that? Yeah. So skill. There's a, a different scaling point in real estate journey, right? So you can do it through volume, right? So if you get one property, you want to like do two, you want to do four, eight, right? And, and, and try to like expand it from there. So that's the scaling point in volume. You can also try to scale in deal size, right? So one property with one units versus one, one property with, let's say, 20 units, right? So there's different scaling point in real estate, but either way you look at it, you need capital. Right, and our capital is so limited, right? Like it doesn't matter how how fast you can save, you're never gonna beat the inflation because your lifestyle is also going to be inflating, right? As you're like, you know, having uh, your partners, you're, you're getting married, have kids, it's always gonna go up. So I never believe in uh, uh, saving it. Like I believe in drawing some income in for your cash flow play, but then you have to figure out a way to how to acquire assets so that you can actually go against the inflation. Right, so the way I'm thinking about raising capital is, is very simple. We need to build our business or we need to have our full-time job. And on top of that, we need to uh, learn the skill set of raising capital so that we can keep acquiring the properties that we want, right? Either through volume or through deal size, right? So that's why like, I'm like, this is one of the necessary skill set for every investor. And it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or you're intermediate or you're advanced, you need to raise capital from others so that you can offer your own project. Yeah. Dude, I, I agree with you. I was thinking about the other day, I was thinking like, you know, some of the biggest in, uh, names in real estate that we know, we all know, whether or not we respect them is a different question, but we all know them, right? Like I think uh, Brandon Turner is, is, was the host for many years of Bigger Pockets, right? Big real estate. I, I know him personally and he's he's bought, I want to say like, 
I, I want to say it's in the hundreds of millions in terms of real estate, all using other people's money, right? He's raising capital for big multifamily deals. Now we could sit here and argue whether that's a good idea or a bad idea or whatever. But like the fact is he's raising the capital, right? And then you've got Grant Cardone, of course, like Grant Cardone, one of the, like one of his famous sayings is like, where's my money? Like, <laughs> who's got my money, right? Like somebody out there has the money I need to do to do a deal. And uh, so, so where does, where does someone like those guys are obviously big. They're putting together a huge syndication. They've got lawyers that they pay tens of thousands of dollars to like, they are, they are doing it at a very, very high, big level. So where does where does someone start? But like they want to buy like their first co living home, like they got one or two. You yeah, know? they can't they can't afford all of that stuff to set it up. How does someone start that journey to raising capital? Yeah, so most people don't raise capital because they don't feel comfortable about their business model yet, right? So um, most people feel that way because it's like okay, you're approaching friends, family, and your maybe your colleagues, and you're like okay. Now people are trusting their capital with me, but I'm not even confident with my operation, right? Or where I distribute my, my capital. And I don't want to, I don't want the, uh, my lack of experience in the operation to affect my relationship with the contacts that I have. So that's the biggest turning point. Is there's a two ways to actually really solve that. One is to really just get a mentor, right? And try to walk you through every step uh, along the way so that you can raise capital and be confident that you have someone that, you, that can guide you through the whole operation. Number two is kind of like what I did. I, I really used a co-living space in student rental up on their full properties, and then I started raising capital. But that was a very long journey. I didn't actually start raising my very first capital until like four years later, wow. right? So doing it over again, I, I would probably go uh, with the option one I just mentioned, which is try to figure out my operation and then verify that this model with someone who's already in the game. And then I'll use that, understand how everything is structured, and then maybe I'll just go out there, start using social media to attract more investors, increase my credibility, and start doing the self pitch to everybody around me. Yeah. Because that will really shorten that learning curve from four years all the way down to maybe one year. Maybe I'll, I'll still acquire my very first one with my own capital. Right. But the second one, I can start raising capital. And all of a sudden, by the time I'm in like year four, I'm not going to just have four properties only. I'll probably have like 10, 15, 20. Right. Uh, right. Depending on how fast I want to grow. So you're saying, what I hear you saying is like, hey, you have to be confident in your operation. If you're not confident in your operation, then you need to, have, you need to be able to tie yourself to a mentor or a coach that can, that can help you. You know, I, like, I, like for example, I guess what I'm thinking is like, I tell people like, hey, if you're raising capital, somebody may not give you capital to buy your first co-living deal. Or, but, but, but if you say, hey, I'm getting coached by this person, they're helping me, then you have a little bit more credibility if you have that, um, someone that's there really supporting you in that journey, for sure. right? For sure, for sure, yeah. And then, and then the other thing you said, I'm just kind of pulling this out, I think it's so wise, man, is like, then it's just like, are you even asking? <laughs> like, I feel like people, like sometimes they get really scared to ask for money. Yeah. Um, and it's like, uh, you know, so, so what, do you have any tips for overcoming that? Because like, I feel like that's like, a, like you said, oh, you would, you're very confident. You're a real estate coach. You're a real estate investor. Like you get this, you get this and you've been doing it for years. But what about someone who's beginning and like th they are nervous? Yeah. What are some things that they can do to overcome the nerves of like, I got to go ask for 20K for this deal or 50K or to partner with someone? What is that? What is that? Okay. Thought process so, for you. So, so uh, I'll give you a story. Actually, uh, the moment I started raising the capital, uh, and it started uh, sort of like start growing without a family resource, right? The number one things that my that, that my family was telling me is that now business and family needs to be completely separated. So, I had a capital problem immediately. I couldn't actually refine my property because it was just a lot of resistance from the family side. So, I had to really figure out how to raise that capital. But I knew my business model already at the time. I knew that it's going to be a birth strategy. Um, I knew that there's going to be a couple of flips that I need to do to really accumulate my, uh, my, my, my initial capital for my next project. So the, the, the plan was very good. I was like reaching out trying to figure out how to actually do that. And then all of a sudden I'm like, hey, do you know anybody who might be interested in joining in, in, in this project that I'm thinking about? Because I'm going to get in. I, I'm just looking for someone who might be interested in, in coming in with me. So I did, and I realized that my response rate was way more positive when I don't ask the money directly from that person. It's kind of like I asked you, Sam, hey, listen, do you know anybody who might be interested in joining this uh, project? And then all of a sudden, Sam is like, well, Ping, what are you talking about? Like, I've been following your content. Like, I see what you're doing. I'm, I'm interested, right? Like, uh, how, how, don't skip me, right? Because all of a sudden, it creates that kind of formal uh for people who are not uh being considered 
So that was a really good way to start the conversation. I just picked that up uh, by accident. And another one was I approached my family's uh, family friend. And then the way I approached it was, uh, it wasn't because I wanted to pitch to them because I, I wasn't confident enough as well. Um, but at the time I'm like, hey, listen, can I just do a pitch for you? Because I got a really interesting project that I want to pitch it to my network. Would you mind t uh, listen to it and give me some feedback? So I used this way and then all of a sudden my family friends was listening, listening, listening. And then he asked me, he asked me quite a bit of questions about how I handled the money, the projects and all that stuff. What happens if, uh, if we're unable to actually exit uh, two years down the road? What was what's our approach, right? And I, after handling all the objection, he actually, he actually told me, he's just like, you know what? I might actually be able to fund you uh, this project, right? Based on everything that you were saying. I still want to see how you can actually um, uh, really operate it uh, for, for different projects uh, like you mentioned, but I, I, I wouldn't be opposed to investing in this one. And then right there, I secure, I think 150K uh, just from this, uh, this family friend. Wow. So, these two different ways is kind of like an indirect and that uh, that later on i really i really understood what i was doing because at the time i was just testing out different things and obviously there was a lot of no but these two ways was very effective and then i realized that raising capital t takes multiple different sessions before someone will actually trust you with their money mm, and good. that being said you we don't do the hard pitch in the very beginning we need to do a soft pitch Right, and we need to establish our credibility. We need to establish and qualify ourselves before we even talk about our own projects. Dude, so good, so good. There's a couple questions. Someone's saying, uh, Evan is saying, hey Sam, do you know where I could find the capital coming out of college broke with no future employment position in place? Okay, I got a question. For, sorry, I got an answer for that. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I was able to raise $550,000 at the age of 25. Let's go. Yeah. You, okay, there you go. Well, so, 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 was it was that because of the deals that you brought to those people? Like they were good deals. You you focused on finding good deals, and people believed in it. Or was it because you knew? What, well, how were you able to do that? Because I did enough soft pitch and qualified myself first. And just so you know, that was my very first deal that I need to raise capital without my family support. So at the age of twenty five. Uh, just in school, I did have a, like at the time, I, I did have a full-time engineering job, right? So there was a lot of things that I, I was able to kind of like show them that, that there's a, the income to me is not a problem, right? This is just something that I'm passionate about doing it. I want to okay. continue building it, right? And then I'm uh, basically just allowing more investors to, to join. I don't need to make a lot of money, but I just want to get the momentum going. So, so, but what I'm trying to say is that at the age of 25, there's a tons of people who are talking about not being able to raise capital after 30 years old, after 35 years old, or like 40 years old, right? And they were just like, uh, people around me won't, don't have money or whatever. It's not that like they don't have money, it's because they don't trust you yet. Right, right. right. So right. let's handle that objection first. Why do people want to invest in you? And let's reverse engineer that. That's brilliant. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's Brandon Turner who says like, whenever you're looking for a partnership of some kind, someone's, someone's got to bring the money someone's got to bring the time and the effort yeah. and that could be to manage the deal oversee the deal oversee the rehab whatever kind of deal it is that someone's bringing money someone's bringing time and effort and then someone's brings what, what he calls specialized knowledge yeah. and you know you might be the person with all three of it you might have specialized knowledge you have the time and effort to do the deal and you have money and so therefore you don't need partners but you know evan is asking i think about like i think it's really important to know what you bring to the table like what is yep. your and I, and I think what you're saying ping is like people have to know and like and trust you and if you if you overcome that objection first then the next part is easy and i think also it's like understanding hey guys i'm bringing i don't have, like in the first deal where you raised five hundred fifty thousand, like you didn't you didn't you're not bringing the money right you're bringing something else you're bringing one of those other two pieces to the table and so i think understanding that is really 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 important too yeah exactly Exactly. Shiva and, says, and also don't don't show desperation, right? Like when you're asking for money, mm -hmm. to, uh, try to raise a bit of capital. Like relax, keep it gentle, right? Like don't don't like, again go on dates. You don't like you don't try to do the, you don't try to hit a home run right away, right? You get to know each other, you qualify yourself, you, you see if it's a good fit. It's the same thing with the building relationship in real estate industry, right? You're building a you're, you're you're trying to establish your credibility first, right? And you're you want to see if it's a good fit. 
right? Yeah. And just because someone says they have a 100K, 150K, it doesn't mean they're a good fit either. So. Right. Right. Dude, the dating analogy works. This is a sleep, like, right? That's, that's a good one. I, I really, I dig that. Sh Shiv is ask, uh, Evan, I hope that's helpful, man. I hope that, I hope that was helpful for you. And, uh, yeah, that's great. Great. He says, thanks for the insight guys. That's awesome. Shiv is asking as an estimate, how much does someone need to save for their first co-living home? Shiv, it really depends, man. I think for you, I know Shiv is a friend of mine. I think for you, man, it's like you, you you know, in a perfect world, you'd kind of do what Ping was saying when we first started this call. You would live in the home and you'd rent out the other rooms if you're just getting started. That's by far the best way to start because you can get the best loans. You can get a loan with 3% down, 5% down, you know, maybe. And so therefore, you know, in Charlotte, North Carolina, for example, if you buy a $300,000 house, then, you know, the 3% on 300000 is nine grand plus closing costs. So you need probably twelve or 15 grand to start, right? Obviously, it still has to make sense. The deal has to make sense. But, um, you know, if the, if the home is 12, if 400 grand, you got to have 12 grand plus closing costs to get started. Right. And and so but but otherwise, as you go through, if you don't want to live in the home, then you probably you could use you could potentially get a second home loan, which would be 10 percent down. Or if you do more an investment type product, you're probably going to be putting 15 or 20 or 25 percent down. And that's you need to you need to save or raise that capital for that down payment. But Ping, what would you what would you say to that first that question, man? Exactly what you said. The only thing that I will add on top of that is that if you don't have that additional 20, 30 or 50 K, you can also raise that. It's okay to actually give, give up, give up a bit of equity, right? Because the whole concept of a cold living is that you're going to have a massive cash flow because you're going to be living in there. You're going to be managing uh, the, the heavy operation with a cold living concept, but the cash flow is going to be really good, which means it, it will put you into a position where you can offer a little, a little bit more to your investors. So, what you can do is to try, try to qualify for the mortgage, raise a bit of capital so that you don't have to wait or save that money, and then just store that into one property where you're managing like multiple different uh, individual tenants in your home. Let me ask you. Let's let's say let's say uh, you needed fifty grand to 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 buy a co living deal, sure. and you raised you raised fifty grand. Uh, what would you give? And that was the whole down payment. And then the, you know, you're planning on renting it out and that's going to pay for the mortgage and all the expenses and all that. What would you give someone in exchange for giving you the 50 grand? Just curious, like you're, would yeah. you be like, Hey, I'm going to give you, would you just set, would you structure it as a private money loan to you? Or it's just like, you give me the money and I pay you interest only payments. Would you try to give them some equity in the deal? And if so, curious, your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, so, uh, 50 K is not that much money, right? So some people want, don't, wouldn't want to take the portion of the profit because now all of a sudden the money is tied up with the project that you're living in. So you might create a lot of, uh, I guess, um, uh, questions, raise a lot of questions with the conflict of interest. So most people in this case will probably prefer a uh, private lending, but I'm not saying that, uh, don't, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that make that assumption for other people. Always try to understand what everybody's situation is. If you got a friend, who believes in what you're doing and they don't actually need that uh, uh, interest payment because they're not putting the uh, line of credit or they're not like it's, it's purely saving that that's no cost right. right for them to invest maybe do structure something more like a share profit of uh, sorry profit sharing is that uh, right. actually works out better for them right but in in based on my experience right anything 50 under 50 or 100k if, it, if you don't have a clear exit strategy, you're trying to build up that cash flow, most people will probably just prefer the, the, uh, the, the fixed uh, return. Right. Like a private, basically a private loan to you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's awesome. I love that. I love that strategy. So you could give them a, so to, to recap, you, you would give it, you could do it as a private loan and just give them, hey, I'm going to give you 7%, I'm going to give you 8%, I'll give you 9% or, what, you know, whatever percent you uh, choose or, you say, I'm going to give you 20% of profits. Obviously, figure out what, what number makes sense based on the what the cash flow is going to be and what the total cost of the property is and all of that. Uh, you could do that as well. Yeah. Man, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it, man. Well, dude, this has been, I know we, I know we said we were going to jump on for like 10 minutes. I feel like we've been on for like 15 or 20 minutes, but um, what, to, what can I do? What can I do to support you, man? How can I help you support you? I love what, I love what you're doing. I think you're very knowledge. It's cool to... It's cool to just, I told you this when we got on our practice one, I said, uh, has this been valuable guys? I hope it's been valuable. If you've been watching this, um, I know a bunch of people, it's just fun to have conversations like this. 
where you yeah. and I can just sit here and kind of chat back and forth, but at the same time, um, you know, let other people kind of just be in on the conversation, which has been yeah. really cool. What's up, Diana? You know what? So here's the thing. I don't, uh, we haven't actually started pushing our social media until almost only like a year uh, ago. So obviously, whoever that wants to kind of jump on our platform, talk about their experience, right? Like even co living, like how do, how do people actually get started? We're more than happy to have you on our show and, or like even on, in one of our sessions to really explain about like the, to, to basically share your real estate journey with other people. I think that's the best way to, you know, like support each other. That's awesome. Awesome, man. Yeah. So you run your show as a podcast and it's an education platform. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. That, that's awesome, man. And it's called, could you just, could you just plug it one more time here? Sorry, say that again? Could you just plug it one more time? <clears throat> like, plug, plug what? Sorry. Uh, like what, what the name uh, of it is? Sorry, like promote it. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the YouTube channel is called Property Hustlers. And that's, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then my my Instagram. You can, if you feel feel free to reach out to me uh, if you want to just send me a DM for your questions. Uh, it's ping underscore real estate. Boom. Awesome. Well, dude, that's awesome. Thanks for jumping on for a few minutes. Great to get to know you. Love your work. Super valuable. I think I think the tips today, like those are super valuable tips for raising capital, man. That helps people kind of shape their brain around. Okay, if I don't have enough capital, how can I do that? And I love what you said. If I could just summarize everything, you know, it'd be like become a capital raiser now. <clears throat> yeah don't like i feel like that was your encouragement right it was like become a capital raiser now don't feel like you've got to wait 15 years or 10 years or even five years like you can raise capital now so i think just your confidence in people and the fact that your stories you did it at such a young age that's powerful man so thank you so much for sharing all that appreciate, appreciate having me thank you so much yeah dude all right have a good day hey take Talk care soon.